because I'm uh, in the process of designing a living building home here in Alberta, one of three potentially in the world right now, the living building challenge also has a living community challenge. And based on the premise of the, the living building challenge in general, it's heavily steeped in permaculture if you kind of read between the lines. And so a vision could be something like the living community challenge if you wanted something that was more prescriptive. And so what permaculture is, is essentially um, it's a toolbox of tools to help you get there. And so it encompasses engineering and architecture, construction, planning, ecology, community, and economics. And uh, it's trying to figure out how to turn all of these silos into kind of one circle. And that's ostensibly one of the biggest issues is that there is a lot of, or a lack of communication amongst these dis disciplines, trying to understand how they all play together. And permaculture gives us a framework to be able to do that. So permaculture is a design process guided by ethics. And I was contemplating actually running a workshop with you guys today on this, but uh, I don't think we're gonna have time. And so in the future, if you guys would like to see how some of the design tools within permaculture, I'm happy to present that to you in a future presentation. Honestly, a th there was a 30 minute tool that I learned in my first design course that I took more than a decade ago, which completely revolutionized my understanding of engineering. Uh, they could have literally spent 30 minutes in my engineering degree and it would have completely transformed what I got out of that degree. So I had to go to permaculture to go and get that. Part of what permaculture is, is a process. And Bruce Mao, a famous Canadian architect, said that process is more important than outcome. When the outcome drives the process, we'll only ever know to where we've already been. But if the process drives the outcome, we may not know where we're going, but we'll know that we want to be there. And so it's a design process that's guided by ethics and copies nature, ostensibly. The reason that it has to be process driven is is you guys have all probably done projects where you end up in this squiggly mess and you don't know if you're gonna be sick or, uh, or if you're gonna <laughs> lose your mind because you're stressed out because you can't see the end. But when you have a process that's tried and true that always gets you to the other side, the only thing you need to do is stop worrying and just sit back and rely, that you're pro rely on your process that it's gonna get you to where you need to be. And I would argue that we need to be living in a, in a society, in human habitats, that are able to uh, manage all of these liabilities and turn them into opportunities so that humans can be just as positive as we are negative. And so Bill Mollison had this saying, um, he's got lots of great quotes and I encourage you to check them out. The greatest change that we need to make is from consumption to production, even if only a small, on a small scale in our own gardens. And when he uses the word garden, it kind of comes across as, as like hippie or, or dreadlocky, you know, like you can kind of get the sense that we're all supposed to, to manage backyard gardens. And that's not really what he's saying. Um, the word garden here is actually another word for habitat. So if you look at the beaver, if you look at chimps, if you look at the Arctic fox, if you look at ants and aphids, almost every species on the planet manipulates their environment in order to create habitat for themselves. The Arctic fox is a really neat one because you can actually see their dens from space. They're actively propagating habitat around their dens. And so because other species have the right to manipulate their ecosystem and they can do it in a productive way that allows other things to thrive, there's a very good analogy or, or example of, um, for why humans can have the same right. So a gardening is essentially the manipulation of our ecosystems to the benefit of humankind, but also to the ecosystems around us. And that's really what Bill's trying to get across in the word garden in this quote. So if only 10% of us do this, there's enough for everyone. Hence the futility of revolutionaries who have no gardens, who depend on the very system they attack, and who produce the words and bullets and not fruit and shelter. And so this is not about activism and it's not about um, trying to, to fight against the system. It's trying to understand how um, we can all be producers as opposed to just constantly being consumers. And I'm not saying that we're going to get rid of all consumerism. I'm saying that at least a percentage of our consumption can come from more local sources because, again, coming back to the initial quote, when the needs of the system are not met from within, we pay the price in energy and pollution. And so going forward, as we start to use approaches like this in the creation of multi-block spaces, cities, communities, towns, subdivisions, we can inform the fences, if you will, or the rules, or make encouragements or incentivize 
um, activities that encourage these systems to not just take care of their stormwater, not just to take care of their energy, but to take care of all of those liabilities and really map out um, all of the kind of local and distant liabilities that we create and figure out how they connect together. So all of a sudden you don't have a gray water problem, you have a garden deficiency. In the ag agrarian side of things, we say we, you don't have a slug problem, you have a, a lack of ducks in the system. So the problem can always be the solution. And usually the problem that we create is a lack of conductivity between one or more of our resources. And so we don't have a phosphorus problem. In fact, all the phosphorus is currently going through our sewage treatment plants. We have a, an inability to properly and efficiently and effectively connect that phosphorus back to the land that it came from. And there's lots of solutions that we can talk about that. We don't have a natural gas deficiency. We just have to stop plowing the land and requiring uh, synthetic fertilizers. We don't have a peak oil problem. We just have to grow our food closer to where we currently live and with the, spend less energy on transport. And we can go through all these liabilities and flip them on their head and understand where those connections exist within the, the places that we live. <clears throat> I think it's important to recognize that, that part of what we're doing is we're creating another layer of constraint. And so, and I recognize you guys are under an enormous amount of pressure to put more people per square meter. And I, I understand that there's development in real estate and, and uh, municipal taxes that come into all of that stuff. But there might actually be, and this is kind of what Jeffrey West was getting at in his book, Scale, there might actually be an optimal density. And that's not a conversation that I hear too often. I, I get a lot of, I was just speaking at the Eco Symposium in Toronto and this came up as well, that we need to create spaces that are denser, that have more humans per square meter. There might be a sustainable, a long-term sustainable holding capacity of land. And if, if, if sustainability and long, the long-term survival of our species, and I know that sounds dire, but there's plenty of people talking about this right now in very high places. If, if that's actually a concern within our, our design systems, we may have to have a, a hard conversation about um, what that looks like. But very simply, if, we, if we're absolutely dead set on super high density, it's about mapping out energy flows, basically. And so if you've got a, a sewage flow, that's just a form of energy and trying to understand how to put that energy to productive use. So one way that you can be a lot more ecological when it comes to sewer is I'm trying to think there's a place in BC what's the name of it barrier I believe has something called a living machine so instead of using conventional sewage treatment mechanisms you you look at how to cycle the water on site so you're not having to, to move it all over the place and and that allows you to take that that nutrient and find productive systems to, find productive ways to put it to productive use ostensibly. So it's, it's, about, it's all about creating connections. So where's the rainwater coming from and where's water needed? Where's the sewage coming from and where's the phosphorus, nitrogen, potassium and micronutrients that are within those sewage streams required? And how do we find appropriate technologies that meet those, that primary ethos in order to stop moving those, those resources out? And in terms of high density and cities like Vancouver, there's still enormous amounts of land that, that are underutilized in those spaces when it comes to meeting things like food production. And so mapping out those opportunities and understanding that when food is not supplied from within the city, even if it's peri-urban, that we are requiring food from places like California and Mexico and to be quite frank with you, I don't know how much longer California is going to be able to feed Canada with greens. I mean, I'm surprised they've been able to keep the wheels on the bus this long with the kind of drought issues that they've got. So we're fundamentally coming up to some hard constraints and, and we force liabilities onto these other environs when we don't look at how to deal with those needs internally. So we have a five step process that we use in our there's kind of process within process here. And so anything that I do on a consulting basis starts with a heavy, heavy diagnosis. And I think that 80% of the solution lives in the diagnosis. Um, and so first we start off with, with clarifying our values and vision. And so that's that kind of ethical um, and value oriented kind of 30,000 foot view of where 
or of what's important to us in our community or if we're going at a, on a smaller scale, our, our client. And, and that's kind of the driving, how we, how we basically create holistic decisions. We've got to make decisions that buttress those values and that vision. Once we have that, then we diagnose our, our ecosystem. We actually start, we have what's called the scale of permanence. And so our scale of permanence is 12 factors. And it starts off by understanding the constraints with the factors that are hardest to change. So geology, climate, water, access, structures, flora, fauna, business, technology, and, and then soil. And so all of these factors um, play into the way that we design sustainable human habitat. When we start messing with systems that are very hard to change, we end up with all sorts of other liabilities. And I'll give you an example in Calgary in 2013, we had the, the massive flood here. We ignored geology, climate, and water at the expense of you know, the, the hundreds of millions of dollars that it cost to fix our city after those floods. And so uh, we ended up, you know, over the last hundred years, allowing our city to expand onto point bars on rivers. And, and so the process um, starts by acknowledging that nature has far more staying power than we do. And, uh, and we have to acknowledge her power and, and where, you know, ignoring where she has agency, essentially, ultimately is going to cost us in the long run through disasters. And, and when we look at climate change, this is absolutely becoming the case. So we really have to understand our strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities in all of those categories. And then from there, use those, that SWOT analysis ostensibly in our diagnosis process to understand what opportunities exist for us on the back end. And so we really allow our bioregion or our ecosystem or the space that we're designing to tell us what it wants to be. And when we do that, we can circumvent those type one errors that those costs that will be borne by uh, the next generation. And maybe sometimes it's even faster than the next generation. Sometimes it's this generation. So the five step process that we were talking about was clarify your, your values and vision, diagnose the area that you're designing for its strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and threats, um, and then do design. So all of that diagnosis informs design. And you can th think of this as essentially just creating a giant Venn diagram and then monitor and manage your system for, um, for weakness and assume that you're wrong. And so we come into design with, this, with, a, um, with humility and we create feedback mechanisms to course correct in the event that we did get it wrong. The risks. Um, Nassim Taleb wrote a book called Anti-Fragile and the book before that was The Black Swan. The concept of a black swan is basically a hyper extreme event like the 2013 floods in Calgary that is impossible to predict, at least in terms of t time and scale. And, um, but when they occur, they fundamentally change humanity. And so, or, or at least the bioregion. And so Hurricane Katrina was like that. Um, the Calgary floods in 2013, Fukushima, these are all black swan events. And so the only solution that there is to black swans is understanding the randomness of our environs and, and then categorizing the systems that we depend on. So in this case, cities in order to be able to continue to exist. So we, once we understand what those are, we, I, and we could make a strong case for food, energy, water, waste removal, uh, you know, those would be good ones to talk about it initially. We can then look at all of those systems and classify them from a risk perspective in terms of whether they're fragile, so they break easily, and, and we can, it's not very hard to figure out what's fragile and what's not fragile. If they're resilient, which means they resist breaking, which most of our systems are because we have surplus energy right now, or if they're anti-fragile, which basically means that they're systems that actually benefit from volatility. I would argue that most city infrastructure is fragile to resilient at best. Some might be anti-fragile, but, but that should be the goal that we're going on. And so once we categorize our system into those three areas, anything that falls under the concept of fragile should be addressed on, uh, on a societal level. Um, and if society is not addressing it, then it should be addressed on an individual level. So if you dig into the number of 55 gigajoules per person per year for the average North American diet, 
That is an incredible fragility that depends on a stable climate, sources of natural gas, irrigation, which is almost all gone in the south uh, east, uh, the Kansas area, based on the, the Ogallala Aquifer. I mean, we could spend all day just discussing the risks that are um, that are baked into the food system. And um, and so once you understand whether or not they're fragile, resilient, or anti-fragile, then if you can't supply it in a high density site, then by all means produce it off site somewhere close, and then quantify the risk associated with that form of production and ensure that you have insurance policies in place. And I mean that figuratively, not literally, so that your most crucial systems are not at risk of collapse. And so NASA has got a great saying that one is zero and two is one. And I would argue that most of the world, and this is just based on like hard data that you can go and collect yourself, is in a very fragile state from a, a food production perspective. Yeah, so there's little bits and bits and bobs of this. Um, I don't think anybody's really kind of come at it through the lens of, of a holistic, the total holistic approach, but, but there's definitely signs of this stuff happening. And so Portland is a great example of how the city took a very holistic look on the management of water. And then uh, the city of Edmonton has actually eliminated some of the rules and regulations around urban farming. So they've actually incentivized people to use their properties by allowing the sale of produce right from their, their street corner, essentially. So they don't have to have a business license to do that and they, they don't have to go to a farmer's market. They can literally sell it right off their farm. What, really interesting statistic, guys. So I did a, a calculation on the amount of gasoline that's currently being spent on uh, managing lawns, gasoline, fertilizers, and pesticides. Um, there's actually enough land, if you just look at the amount of lawn in, in aggregate in cities right across the United States to produce all the food that urbanites need, literally. And I know that I keep coming back to food and I told you this isn't about food. Food's just the biggest liability. But when we start creating ecosystems that generate our own fuel, our food for ourselves, we take care of uh, a lot of the energy liabilities, we take care of the carbon liabilities, we take care of the stormwater liabilities, we take care of even in some cases the heating liabilities if we get the design right. So it's about how we cultivate the, the, the gardens around us um, that really matters. So Detroit has been trying to reinvent itself, you guys have probably heard about that, by trying to incentivize kind of production within the city. Um, I said Edmonton, so those would be a couple of examples that are that I, I would say are moving absolutely in the right direction. There's other social initiatives in Portland that are really neat to help um, get homeless people into housing by um, taking some city lands and allowing them to actually, this sounds crazy, but they're actually helping them to build their own structures to deal with the homeless population, which actually is a really high track record of getting them back into jobs. So Portland would be a, a really good one to go study, I think, if you're looking for an initial case study. Yeah, I can show you what we've done here in Calgary, and that's like the microcosm. I think part of the part of the problem is that we've asked planners and politicians to take on too much. That you guys have got liabilities that are very challenging to deal with on your own, and it, it's very very hard to do that. And so part of the solution, I think, is to empower, to recognize that everybody has to be rowing the boat together. And so there's going to be some things that can be handled on a on a house by house basis. For example, um, the city of Calgary is looking at decoupling stormwater from their from their from their sanitary sewer system on on people's bills to incentivize the use of LID infrastructure at that household level. In Portland, they actually, because they had a combined sanitary storm sewer system and they were being fined massively by the federal government, they, um, <clears throat> they took the $2 billion, I think, that it was going to cost to upgrade their, their sewer system. And they said, well, if we take this $2 billion and we encourage homes to disconnect their, their downspouts from the sewer and put in rain tanks and then take up some parking spaces to encourage more walkable traffic and put in rain gardens, we can probably avoid the cost of the $2 billion sewer upgrade. And as long as future developments all have to meet these basic requirements that are ostensibly just incentives, 
or penalties, depending on how you guys want to enforce it, that the storm sewer, the sewer system will never need to be upgraded, not to the level that it would if they didn't kind of incentivize locals to kind of take a, a portion of the burden. So I think part of it is not shouldering at all, like cities can't shoulder at all, it's too complex. There, there has to be kind of smaller incentives to, for the places that aren't super high density, where they have a little bit of agency over how they manage their property to deal with some of these basic liabilities. So there's a community in Victoria and the name of it is not coming to mind, but they're actually, Victoria has got some really neat initiatives happening. They've also decoupled their storm sewer. There's a specific development though that I need to look up where they're managing all their own sewer through a constructed wetland. It's higher density than just individual homes. Dockside. Yeah, Dockside, that's the one. So I, I think that's a that's getting a bit closer. I I, I think that that there just there aren't a lot of people that are taking this large of a perspective and looking at how all these flows connect. I, I haven't seen I've seen bits of it. I haven't seen it all kind of coming together in one in one system.